Shalom, everybody. Welcome to this week's Journey Through Torah. This week, we are in Parshan uh, Vayeshev, and he dwelled. We're talking about Jacob. He's in the area of the land that he's dwelling in, but it's kind of interesting how uh, once he's like settling in, then we kind of change the narrative a little bit, because this week, we're introduced to Yosef and the, the life of uh, Yosef and his brothers and the relationship. It's very complicated, to say the least. But some of the things we're going to point out in this portion is how Yosef is uh, like a foreshadow, if you will, of Yeshua. And a lot of things that happen in the life of Yosef, we see again coming around in the life of Yeshua. So Yosef is a very prophetic figure about Yeshua and his life and what's going to happen to him. But we also see in, in the part shot to come as we close out from this point forward to the rest of the book of, of Bereshit, the rest of the book of Genesis, we see that uh, Yosef's life is also very prophetic and about things that are still yet to come or even are happening now. So there's a lot to cover in this part in this part shot. So if you'll stick with me, we'll get in and cover that. We're going to start in uh, chapter 37 and verse 2, it says, these are the generations of Yaakov, and then it starts with Yosef. Interesting way to put it, because uh, the generations told, though it's, it's reminiscent of, like you're chronicling something. These are the generations. These are uh, like the origin of something, and this is where it's all like going and where it came from. It uh, kind of mirrors the picture we get from Genesis 2, verse 4. It says, these are the generations, the told oath of the heavens and the earth when they are created in the day that Yahweh God made the earth and the heavens. So it's kind of uh, chronicling a story, if you will. It's, it's go, or going back to the beginning. There's something that's going to start un, unfolding before us. I mean, we've had some pretty amazing stories up to this point, but here we're all, we're going to see a lot of things kind of start to change. And, and we're going to see a lot more of, of uh, pictures of Yeshua directly related in here. Okay. So when we say these are the generations of Jacob, Joseph, why would it start with Joseph? Joseph was not the firstborn. Okay. Um, so why would it start with Yosef being listed first in there? Okay. So we're going to see the story of Yaakov and the story of Yaakov through the life of Yosef, which is where a lot of the prophecy comes in. We'll get to that in the next coming in the next couple of weeks. But Yosef was a firstborn. He was the firstborn of Rachel, the one whom Yaakov uh, wanted to marry, the one whom he wanted to marry in the first place. So Yosef could have been considered a firstborn by Yaakov, maybe, um, but yet he was not the firstborn born to him because the firstborn to him was Reuben, right? So here we have Yosef. He's actually the 11th son of the 12 sons. So we're, we're seeing something that seems out of place. It seems out of order here, but that should even more get our attention. Okay. Because if we say, well, this is the generations of Jacob. And then we start with, you know, Reuben. Okay. Well, it's just following order. This is following way out of order here. And it's starting with the 11th son. So we should open our eyes, open our ears and uh, see what's happening here. Okay. So if we continue to read, we see that Yosef was shepherding. Uh, it says, these are the genealogies of Jacob. When Joseph was 17 years old, he was a youth. He was shepherding the flocks with his brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. A couple things to notice here. First off, notice that the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, not with the sons of Leah. So could this be, uh, could this be hinting? at rejection here. Um, you know, Rachel had passed. Okay. So would he be with the sons of Leah here as he's, he's working and gathering out together with them and doing these? No, he was with Zilpah and Bilha. Uh, so this could, could also give us a picture of the sons of Leah again, and their rejection of, of Yosef. Also notice this phrase where it says that he was shepherding the flocks with his brothers. Uh, it reads, Roe et Achav Batson. So that can also read, so he was shepherding his Aleph Taf brothers with flocks. So, I mean, we translate that. Well, he was shepherding 
uh, the flocks with his brothers, but it doesn't really read that way. The way that it reads is he was shepherding all of tough brothers with flocks or in the flocks either way. And, uh, and that kind of draws a different picture here. So it's like, he wasn't just shepherding the sheep. He was also trying to shepherd and corral his brothers and bringing them together. And, and we're not going to touch on the, on the story of the pride in his heart and, and directly the dreams that were given here at this point. But, uh, Yosef was a, a young man and proud. And, and some of the things that he read, if you literal reading of the scriptures, the way some of these things come across towards his brothers does seem a little arrogant. It, it, it does. So, um, you can see where there's a lot of contention that that's between Yosef and his brothers. And, uh, there's a lot that has to happen in their relationship, which again, we'll address in the weeks to come. So we get on to verse 12. It says after this, when his brothers had gone to pasture their father's sheep and Shechem. So again, they went to tend the flock. It's Lirot at Zon and the, uh, to tend the Lirot and the Aleph Taf, the flock. So again, we see another picture here in relationship to the Aleph Taf when it's standing uh, in these words. Uh, I do believe it has some something to do with the Messiah. And it's interesting that these uh, two dots are there above the Aleph Taf, uh, which could symbolize a few different things. One, uh, I believe this could, this could be symbolizing the, uh, the split that Israel would evidently or eventually come to, come to happen. Uh, like Yosef being divided off between his brothers, which we see here is not a far cry. I mean, this is happening here in his life. So we see these things starting to happen. They went to Shechem and they're supposed to be there, but they didn't stay there. Instead, they went on to uh, Dothan. Okay, so we'll get to that uh, in a minute. So the tribes, they're supposed to be shepherding the sheep. They're supposed to keep them in a place of Shechem, but instead they neglected the sheep. And they went off to Dothan. Now, Dothan was uh, a port city. Uh, it was uh, what happens in port cities. You know, you just count, count it a party town. Okay. So uh, they're supposed to be in Shechem, which is a, a place of decision, valley of decision, place of, uh, of affirming covenant, a place of, I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, choose life. All of these things are supposed to be happening at Shechem, but they were not tending the flocks there. They were, they, they moved the flocks away. So we have a picture of the father sending his son that he would be bringing a promise to them, but, but they were supposed to be tending the sheep, but they went off. Okay. Um, we keep reading Genesis 37, 12 to 14. So his brothers went to graze their father's flocks at Shechem and Israel said to Yosef, aren't your brothers grazing the flocks in Shechem? Come, let me send you to them. And here I am, he said to him. So kind of interesting. He, uh, he, he's talking to him. He, he, he tells him what he wants him to do. Then Yosef says, here I am. So it uh, reads a little awkward, reads a little weird there, but it does give us an interesting picture. He says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go check on your, your brothers, and I'm going to send you to where they're supposed to be shepherding the, uh, the flocks and how they're supposed to be shepherding the flocks. And, he's, and basically he's affirming, here I am send me kind of echoing a little bit from the uh, Isaiah six chapter. Right. So again, we have the significance of Shechem. It's uh, a place between the shoulders. We have Mount Gerizim and Mount Aval there. We have uh, the place where Israel was to declare the, uh, the blessings and the cursings of the covenant. And all the people were to say, amen, all of these things were to be happening at Shechem. And so there's a, uh, there's, there's not just a, a chance in the reading that, Oh, this has just happened to be where they were. No, there's more at play here. The sheep were supposed to be at a place of covenant and discerning what is uh, good and blessing and what is uh, evil and, and the paths they're supposed to walk. But the shepherds did not lead them into those good places. They forsook the sheep and went off to tend to themselves and their own desires. Verse 14 says, So go now and see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock and bring me word. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron and he came to Shechem. So he says, go see the Aleph Tav Shalom of your brothers and the Aleph Tav Shalom of the flock. Again, more pictures here of where we're seeing as uh, pictures and symbols of the Messiah being sent to check on the Shalom of your brothers and the Shalom of the flock. And we do see if we have the eyes to read this in this way, 
the things that happen between Yosef and Yeshua. And we'll continue to draw these comparisons as we go through this portion. So continuing on in verse 14, where it says he sent him from the valley of Hebron and he went to Shechem. So Hebron is not a valley. Hebron is not a valley. Hebron is, is on a hill or on a mountain. So why would it say he sent him from the valley of Hebron? There's something else here that we can read. Okay. So in the Hebrew, it's Be'emek Hebron. So Emek, it means a, something that is a valley or something that is deep. Even like thoughts, okay, deep thoughts, meditative thoughts, something that's that's deep, right? Um, we see this in, in Psalm ninety-two five, where it says, "How great are your works, Yahweh! Your thoughts are very deep." Okay, so that's that's a picture we see here. That's the same word that's used there, emek. So he sent him from the deep of Hebron. So the emek is something that is valley or something that is deep, something that is profound. Rashi, Rashi noted that Hebron is on a mountain, so how can one be sent from the depths of a mountain? So now we get to the word for valley. The word for valley uh, can also mean mystery. So me'emek is, is the word for something deep or a valley, but it can also mean a mystery. So we're starting to see pictures here. We're starting to see pictures of exile, uh, redemption, uh, the story of Israel, the story of Yosef, the story of of being sent to exile and, and return. There's many things that we see here with Yosef being a foreshadow of Mashiach, and we're going to examine some of these in this parsha. So we we looked at Me'emech, so the valley or something deep, um, and then Hebron means the seat of association. The word Haver is to join or to couple together. Uh, haver is also a friend, translated as a friend, or to be joined with something, someone. So we have here the Valley of Hebron can be read as the mystery of Hebron or the mystery of associations. The mystery of who you are associated with as uh, Yosef is being sent to go tend to his brothers and the flock and go check on their welfare and to see what is happening. And then ultimately his brothers reject him, sell him for silver, and then he goes off and, and, and ultimately becomes the ruler of the world that his brothers come before and bow before. And there's a restoration there. And that's an extreme oversimplification of, of what's happening. But that's ultimately where things are going here. So we have a mystery of association, which is interesting. Uh, Romans eleven twenty five to 27 says, For I do not want you, brothers and sisters, to be ignorant of this mystery, Let you be wise in your own eyes that a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer shall come out of Zion and he shall turn away ungodliness from Yaakov. And this is my covenant with them when I will take away their sins. So a partial hardening or a blindness has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in, which is uh, often rendered uh, as Maloha Goyim. Meloha Goim is the filling of the nations that was prophesied by Jacob before he passed regarding of Yosef's son, Ephraim. He said that he will become the filling of the nations. And ultimately, that's what happened to the northern kingdom of Israel, which Jeroboam was ruler of. He was from the tribe of Ephraim. So we see the story of Joseph start a revealing of the mystery of who you are associated with. Now, I'm kind of forming up this way. The long story short, it's covered in the last four portions of the book of Genesis, the book of Bereshit. And it would kind of read this way. Like, again, this is a a, a summary, a a summation of of what's going on in this story. So Israel blesses Yosef while he is in Mitzrayim, while he's in Egypt. And he states that Ephraim and Manasseh will be called by his name, and he will be given an equal share among the tribes of Israel. As a side note, it was declared by Yahweh of Israel that a nation and an assembly of nations would come from Israel. So he prophetically declares that Ephraim will become Maloha Goim. Ephraim will fill the nations. Israel becomes divided with Jeroboam and Rehoboam, and the northern kingdom of the ten tribes, led by Jeroboam from the tribe of Ephraim, Yosef, 
And then the southern kingdom, uh, which is Judah and Benjamin, will be led by Rehoboam, Solomon's son. The northern kingdom will be exiled because of idolatry, and they'll be sent into the world. They'll become assimilated. But ultimately, they will repent and return. And so Ephraim will become those who fill the nations, Maloha Goim, and those who return from the nations. So we have a picture of Yosef, or Ephraim, being throughout the world. And now, is when we go to uh, some other prophetic scriptures, like in Ezekiel 37, 16, we start to see some pictures of, of these uh, restoration of all the people of Israel, all the tribes, all the brothers, all of them represented here. And uh, we see this story over and over throughout the, the prophets, throughout the, the, the Tanakh. We find the story of uh, Israel being exiled, but they will return and they will be restored. In Ezekiel 37, 16, it says, Son of man, take one stick and write on it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. So literally this reads, Le Yehuda, so for Judah, and uh, Levne and the sons Israel of Israel, Chavarav, of those joined with him. So to Judah and to the sons of Israel joined with him. So there's two groups that are mentioned there, Judah and those who join with Judah. And then take another stick and write on it for Yosef, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. So we have Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and Kol Beit Israel, and all the house of Israel, Havarab joined with him. So again, there's two more groups that are there. We have Yosef represented by Ephraim and all the house of Israel that are joined with him. So we have four groups of people represented by two sticks and then those two sticks, we hold them close to one another and then Yahweh says he will make them one in his hand. That's the goal, guys. The goal is always to be one be like a you know Yeshua prayed that we be one with one another, like we be one with uh, with the Father as well. In John seventeen, he said, "Father, I pray that they are one, like you and I are one." Um, it's it's to be divided is never the goal. The goal is to be restored and to be one people with one King, one kingdom, one Shepherd, and uh, all we're one people in 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 His hands. So that's the goal of all of this, right? So even though we may be a people that are divided and separated right now, we need to be thinking about restoration and coming together. Romans 16, 25 to 27 says, Now to the one who is able to strengthen you, according to my good news and the proclamation of Yeshua the Messiah, according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages, but is now revealed through the writing of the prophets, has been made known to all the nations, and according to the commandment of the eternal God, to bring about obedience of faith to the only wise God through Yeshua, the Messiah, to him be the glory forever. Again, what mystery are we talking about that's being done in Yeshua? Well, I believe one of these things that's represented here is Yeshua bringing together all of the people called by his name. In the storyline of the exile and the restoration of all Israel, this is the single largest thread of prophecy through the entirety of the Tanakh. And as another side note, you know, there's only one thing in the entirety of all the scripture that Yahweh says that he is going to do something with all his heart and all his soul. What is that? What is it? You know, we say we're going to do something with all of our heart, right? There's only one thing that Yahweh says he's going to do with all his heart. And it might surprise you what the answer is. It's found in Jeremiah. We're going to read 32 verses 38 to 41 says, they will be my people and I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way so that they may fear me forever for their good and for their children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant with them and I will never turn away from doing good for them. I will put my fear in their hearts so they will not depart from me. Yes, I will delight in doing good for them and with all my heart and with all my soul, I will in truth plant them in this land. See that? He says, with all my heart, with all my soul, I'm going to bring them back to this land, which he was speaking of Israel. So part of this restoration is bringing all the tribes back home, bringing all of them back home, not just a few of them, all of them. Ephesians 3, 6 says, in union with Messiah and through the good news, the Gentiles were to be joint heirs, a joint body, a joint shares with the Jews and what God has promised. Understand Gentile means nations. Gentile does not mean pagan. 
Gentile means nations. So what we have here is a picture of the nations, and, and you can say, okay, but there is the people in covenant with Yahweh, and that is Israel, people not in covenant with Yahweh, and that was the Gentiles, so they were pagan, they worshipped other gods, did other things, and, and okay, that's fine. But the word Gentile does not mean pagan. The word Gentile means nations. So when we read a prophecy like this, he doesn't say, I'm going to bring the pagans as joint heirs. No, he says, I'm going to bring those in the nations, their joint heirs. And so this is what Yeshua has done for us. He has brought us into a place of covenant and to be restored to one people called by his name. So Genesis 37, verses 26 to 28, we're going to look at some things now in regarding to uh, foreshadowing of Yeshua in the, in the life of Yosef. Again, uh, so Judah says to his brothers, uh, remember this is where uh, Yosef, they see his brother, they see uh, Yosef coming along the way, and I go, oh, great, here comes the dreamer. What are we going to do with him, right? So Judah says to his brothers, what profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, and, and his brethren were content. And then they were passed, and then they were passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Yosef out of the pit and sold Yosef to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Yosef into Egypt. And Judah says to his brothers, what it says here, so what profit if we slay Aleph Toph, our brother, and conceal Aleph Toph, his blood? Again, when we have this, I, I think we need to just pay attention to something special in relationship to uh, Yeshua and what's going on here. And it says, and they drew up Aleph Toph, Yosef out of the pit and sold him for silver, and that they brought Aleph Toph, Yosef into Egypt. So, uh, again, pictures of being sold and being uh, given over as a slave and being put in bonds. In Matthew 27, 3, Yehuda said to sell Yosef. Uh, Matthew 27, 3 is another picture. Yehuda is Judas. Uh, different cultures, right? Different languages, different cultures. Judas the translation was Yehuda. His name was Judah. So Judas is Greek. His Hebrew name is Yehuda. So Yehuda had betrayed him and saw that Yeshua had been condemned and he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 silver coins to the head Kohenim and to the elders. Yehuda sold Yeshua for silver. And uh, Genesis 37, 34, they go, they tell Yaakov the story that they made up. They give him the cloak that had the, the blood on it, the blood-soaked clothes. Remember the picture of Yeshua, the blood-soaked clothes. And at this point, the father tore his clothes, and he was uh, crying out. And it says that he tore his clothes. He, it was simla is the word that's used there for simla, and that represents an, an inner garment, not an outer garment, not a coat. It's an inner garment. So it's kind of like he's mourning, and he, he rents his clothes. But again, we can have another picture here of... Uh, Yeshua, when he was uh, on on the on the tree, and and the time came, and the the veil was torn. Right, Matthew twenty seven fifty one. The moment the curtain in the sanctuary, of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom, the earth shook, rocks split apart. So the garment covering the part of the temple, the presence of Yahweh, was rent. The Father was rendering his covering, so to speak. So in the story of Yosef being taken into exile by his brothers, there's a very interesting break that seems very out of place. Uh, Judah goes and gets a wife. This little break in the story seems really odd, okay? But it does kind of make sense when you start to open it up and examine it a little bit. Okay, so while we're just kind of living our lives, doing what we're doing, Yahweh is always moving things for his purposes, always moving things for his plans. The tribes were selling Yosef into slavery. Yaakov was mourning the loss of Yosef. Yehuda was taking a wife. Yahweh was preparing for Yosef for what was to come. And at the same time, he was preparing the line and the conditions from which the king of Israel would ultimately come. That's from David and Yeshua, right? Come from the line of Judah. And uh, he is ultimately lining things up for this to happen. So we see in this, in this, in this parsha a figure of uh, Mashiach ben Yosef. And like I said, we've, I've said a few times that Yosef is a, is a prophecy figure of uh, Yeshua. And we have Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David, the Messiah, the son of Joseph, the Messiah, the son of David. Uh, what this means here, it's not, not literally like Messiah, son of Joseph. What it means is 
he has the characteristics and attributes of Joseph. Okay, and we and and we see that being opened up in in this portion. Let's look at a couple things here. Raphael Patai, who was a scholar who taught Hebrew Hebrew University in Jerusalem, served as professor of anthropology at Dropsy University, had this to say regarding uh, Mashiach ben Yosef. He says, when the death of the Messiah became an established tenet in Talmudic times, this was felt to be irreconcilable with the belief in the Messiah as Redeemer, who would usher in the blissful millennium of the Messianic age. The dilemma was solved by splitting the person of the Messiah in two. One of them called Messiah ben Joseph, was to raise the armies of Israel against their enemies, and after many victories and miracles would fall victim, Gog and Magog. The other Messiah, Ben David, will come after him, and in some legends will bring him back to life, resurrection, which psychologically hints at the identity of these two, and uh, will lead Israel to the ultimate victory, the triumph and the messianic era of bliss. There's also a tradition in the text called uh, Secrets of, of Rav Shimon Bar Yochai that the Mashiach will be concealed and be rejected um let's read part of that it says the messiah the lineage of ephraim shall die there and israel shall mourn for him after this the holy one blessed be he will reveal to them the messiah the lineage of david but israel will wish to stone him and they will say to him you speak a lie for the messiah has already been slain there is no other messiah destined to arise they will scorn him as the scripture says despised and abandoned by men from isaiah 53 3 he shall withdraw and be hidden from them, as Scripture continues, like one hiding faces from us. But in Israel's great distress, they will turn and cry out from their hunger and thirst, and the Holy One, blessed be he, will be revealed to them in his glory, as Scripture promises, together all flesh will see, from Isaiah 40, verse 5. And the King Messiah will sprout up there, as Scripture says, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, he goes on to read, you can see that in Daniel seven thirteen. And it is written after it, and authority was given to him, Daniel 7, 14. And he shall blow his breath at the wicked Armelos and kill him. As scripture forecasts, he will slay the wicked one with the breath of his lips from Isaiah eleven four. So again, here's this picture of uh, Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David. Uh, we also read in uh, Pirche Hechalot that the essential task of the Mashiach ben Yosef is to act as a precursor to the Mashiach ben David. He will prepare the world for the coming of the final Redeemer. Different sources attribute to him different functions, some even charging him with tasks traditionally associated with Mashiach ben David, such as in gathering of the exiles and rebuilding of the Beit HaMakdash and so forth. Again, uh, we have pictures of, of a Messiah who is a suffering suffering servant, so to speak, and, is, is, and then a picture of a reigning, ruling king, but it's the same guy. <laughs> it's the same guy we're looking at, right? Let's draw some comparisons here between Yosef and Mashiach. It says he is loved by his father. Um, Matthew 3.17, again, speaking of Yeshua, this is my beloved son whom I am well pleased. He is hated by his brothers. What we see in Yeshua, John 15.18, the world hates you. You know, they hated me before I hated you. His brothers conspire to kill him. We see in Matthew 26.4 of Yeshua that they consulted they might take Yeshua by subtlety and to kill him. So he goes to the Gentiles. We see in Matthew 12, 18, says, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He is rejected by his brothers. John 1, 11, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. They strip off his garment. Matthew 27, 28, says they stripped him and they put a scarlet robe on him. Uh, they give him over to the hands of the Gentiles. Luke 18, 32 and 33, says he will be delivered over to the Gentiles. It will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. And then they are surprised when he's not in the pit. <laughs> Matthew 28, 5 and 6. The angel says to the woman, do not be afraid. For I know you seek Yeshua who is crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. As he said, come and see the place where he lay. So when they do see him again, there is weeping, which we read in Zechariah 12, 10. And I will pour out on the house of David, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and pleas for, and pleas for mercy, so that they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps for a firstborn. When they see him for whom he is, he is sitting in glory. Colossians 3, 4 says, when the, when the Messiah who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. 
So all of these, you know, we're, we're seeing these pictures and, and how they, the comparisons between the two. And as you read through the story of Yosef, keep this in mind. Okay. Uh, Genesis 39, two and three, but we learn Adonai was with Yosef. He never left him or forsook him, even though it was difficult. It says, so he became a successful man in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that Adonai was with him and that Adonai made everything he set his hand to successful. Interesting phrase here he puts here as well. And he says, and he saw Adonai ki Yahweh ito. So this word for with him is the Aleph Taf, not the Ein Mem. So why with him with the Aleph Taf and why not Emo, which is with him, literally how that reads. So um i'm just going to put out there again just a matter of with the olive top as well remember yahweh says i never he never left him for sukkim right he was with him in all of this times even the going down and he was successful and so i believe the olive top showing up there is just leading into that and then even being sold into slavery yahweh used this used this too um in genesis 37 28 it says that the midianite traders passed by they drew yosef up Lifted, lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 seconds of silver, and they took Yosef to Egypt. Genesis 15, 13, and 14, uh, Yahweh speaking to Avram, he says, Know of a surety, your seed will be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and they will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. And also know that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and after they will come out with great substance. Yosef going down into Mitzrayim, it's kind of like now the ball's rolling. This is, this is happening. This is what was going on. So Yosef is there and, and Potiphar's wife lie with me. And he says, no. And he takes off running and she's holding his coat. <laughs> he took off so fast. He left his coat and, um, and then she accuses him of something he didn't do. So here, here we have another picture of this figure being falsely accused, right? Uh, first Corinthians six eighteen, we see flee fornication, every sin that man does is without the body but he that commits fornication sins against his own body so yes yosef ran but again he was identified because of his garment and then the coat got him in trouble right so yosef is in prison now and it's interesting because what he was accused of could have given him a death sentence he could have been given the death penalty and he but he was put in the king's prison so you kind of wonder if potiphar doubted you know what his wife was saying, but yet he had to do something and he couldn't call his wife a liar. So he had to do something. So he put him in, so he put Yosef in prison instead of having him killed. But even again, even in that, even in prison, Yahweh was, was with Yosef and Yahweh was blessing him and giving him authority. And Yosef was succeeding while most would quit. Okay. Um, consider, you know, he was 17 when he was sold into slavery. And when his brothers see him again, he's like 34. It's like, it had been 17 years. Um, so there's a long time he was in prison in, as well. So Genesis 39, 21 to 23 says, but Adonai was with Yosef, showing him grace and giving him favor, giving him mercy in the sight of the prison warden. And the prison warden made Yosef supervisor of all the prisoners in the prison so that whatever they did, he was in charge of it. And the prison warden paid no attention to anything Yosef did because Adonai was with him. And whatever he did, Adonai prospered. Whatever Yosef did, even in prison, Yahweh was blessing him and prospering him in the midst of that. So even in prison, Yahweh was arranging what we would call circumstances to complete his will and what was going to happen. So what happens here? Well, the cupbearer and the baker who are in the king's prison they have dreams and, and they are um, distraught. They don't know what the, these dreams mean. And, and so here com comes along Yosef. And does Yosef say, oh, I know a thing or two about dreams. You should tell me what they are, right? No, he, he doesn't do this. He, he's learned some things here. With, even with the dreams that he had before, he recognizes, no, Yahweh is the one who gives dreams and interprets dreams. Uh, I tried interpreting my dreams before and it didn't work right now. Granted, uh, they came to pass, but again, Yahweh had to work some things into Yosef's life and to put him in the right place for these things to come to pass. Uh, Genesis 40 verse eight. So they says, we have dreamed a dream and there is no interpreter of it. And Yosef says to them, do not interpretations belong to God. Tell, tell them to me, I pray you. So he's learned some things. He says, interpretations belong to Yahweh, which gives us a few lessons here. 
Be careful trying to read your own interpretations into dreams, into words, into scripture, into prophecy, different things. Um, sometimes we like to twist things into something that's favorable for us or try to make something say something we want it to say, right? And then even in the dreams themselves. Dreams have meaning, okay, um, but I don't believe every dream is from Yahweh. Sometimes it's just things that you're really thinking about. So even when you're asleep, your your mind doesn't sleep. So you're so maybe you're dreaming something that you're thinking about or fretting about or worrying about or just really on your mind. You can't shake it, get it off, so you dream about it. Um, maybe you see something during the day and you have a dream that's similar to it, just something that happens along the lines, right? Um, maybe the dream is a spiritual dream. Maybe it was sent from Yahweh. And maybe it wasn't, maybe it was sent, uh, to, as a torment from someplace else. Right. So there's a lot of involving that. So don't just, uh, automatically assume every dream is, is from God. And that it absolutely means something. No, there needs to be some discernment laid in there as well, because that's the lesson that Yosef had learned does not interpretations belong to God. Not, not okay. Interpretations. Let me figure this out. Right. Second Peter one 20 and 21 says, knowing this first, no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation for the prophecy came not in old time, but by the will of man, the holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy ghost. First Corinthians 13, 12 says, so we th we see things imperfectly like puzzling reflections in a mirror, but then we will see everything with perfect clarity. So all that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely just as God now knows me completely. So he says, do not interpretations belong to God. This is that's something I want to point out pretty interesting here. The word for interpretations is the Hebrew word Petron. Petron, it occurs six times in the scripture. Uh, interpretation it occurs five times. And, uh, and interpretations uh, occurs once. And all in Genesis chapter 40 and 41. Interesting, isn't that? And it's all related to the story of Joseph when it talks about these uh, interpretations belonging to God. So what does it mean to interpret? It means to open something up for, to reveal it. See, that's what he's saying. Interpretations belong to God. So what were the interpretations of these dreams? The cupbearer would be reinstated in three days. Well, the cupbearer, that's the wine, which symbolizes blood as well, right? So the wine, so that's about a matter of being reinstated coming in, but the baker uh, would be broken. He would lose his life. And, and that's like the bread that is broken. Again, we see even in these dreams, pictures of uh, uh, Yosef and the Messiah and how these things can relate as well. So again, to interpret means to open something up and interpret something. It's not just looking at it and taking a guess. No, it's to open it up to reveal something, right? Which leads us to this. I love this story. The uh, two men on the road to Emmaus, they were uh, leaving Jerusalem, right? They were uh, praying in Jerusalem and, and they just beside themselves, you know, here was this man, Yeshua. We thought he was the Messiah. They killed him. What are we going to do now? And, and, uh, now they're going home and you know, what's, what are we going to do? And this man shows up to them and they're like, uh, so why are you guys so, so down? Right? Well, let's take a look at it. Luke 24, 13. So behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus from, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together in reason, Yeshua himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were holden, so they should not know him. So Yeshua appears to them and, and basically says, Hey guys, what's, uh, what's going on? Why are you so sad? And they're like, really, you don't know what's going on. Where have you been? You know, they tell them all these things that are going on about Yeshua and here's Yeshua standing with them. It's amazing, right? But then he says in verse 27, so beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them. He opened up to them from the scriptures to see things concern, concerning himself. So he opened up and expounded to them, starting with Moses and all the prophets. So it don't, does not open interpretation to open up and reveal belong to Yahweh. And that's what Yeshua was doing here. He was opening up and revealing. So then they, they, it was getting late. And so they told him, come home and eat with us. And then and, and, and Luke 24, 30, so it came to pass as he sat at me with them, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. And they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us as he talked with us by the way. And while he, he opened to us the scriptures. So, uh, we have a picture here as this portion of scripture is ending 
of Yosef saying, the things of the scriptures, the things given from Yahweh, the things of dreams, the things of mystery, therefore Yahweh to open up and reveal. Not our own interpretations, not our own thoughts, not our own things. It is Yahweh who holds interpretations. And here we see Yeshua opening up and interpreting the word of Yahweh from Moses, the Torah, and the prophets of things regarding himself. Amazing. So we continue that even into next week's portion where uh, Yosef was, goes from being a suffering servant to being put in a place of authority. And, uh, well, that's all I'm going to say about that because we don't want to give it away. We'll talk about it next week. All right. So that's all we have for you today then, guys. I, I hope this has been a blessing to you. I hope it's been encouraging and I hope it's been challenging as well. And if this has been an encouragement to you and a blessing, then please share it. On whatever avenue you watch or you listen to these teachings, please share them to help get out there. If it's been a blessing to you, then it's going to bless somebody else. So um, please help us get these out there. And if this has been a blessing to you, then please also consider giving a donation on whatever avenue you watch or you listen. Uh, it helps us to continue making these and getting them out there. And so if it's a blessing to you again, let it bless somebody else and let us continue putting them out there as long as we can. All right. So until next time, guys, be blessed, be a blessing, and shalom.